السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Maybe not yet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and of course my dear parents who are here today, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. My name is Hassan Ali and I'm the president of the Muslim Students Association here in Trinity College, Dublin. It's a great privilege to be hosting the event tonight on behalf of the MSA on campus. This is an event that is a collaboration. It's a TCD MSA collaboration with the Islamic societies of Maynooth University, Dublin City University, the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, and University College Dublin. Our guest speaker for tonight is Adnan Rashid. Adnan Rashid is an international speaker, historian, and numismatist who specializes in Islamic history and Islamic apologetics. Now, what the hell is a numismatist, I hear you ask? Adnan Rashid, he collects coins that are of historical significance. And in fact, recently he had a discussion with our brother Paul Williams of Blogging Theology, which is a brilliant YouTube channel that I would highly recommend following, where he talked about history in nine amazing coins which he has in his collection. You may know of him from his many debates and discussions in Hyde Park's Speaker's Corner, and you can find more of his content on his personal YouTube channel. He has a BA in history and a master's in history from the School of Oriental and, Islam, uh, Oriental and African Studies. To start off tonight's event, I'd like to call upon Samir Sasid to recite some verses of the Holy Quran. Brother Samir is a biomedical engineering student in Dublin City University. He has also participated in the King Ab uh, Abdul Aziz International Quran competition earlier this year. So ladies and gentlemen, our brother Samir Sasid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون 
هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Allah says in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Hashr, Ayah 18, O believers, be mindful of Allah and let every soul look to what deeds He has sent forth for tomorrow. And fear Allah, for certainly Allah is all aware of what you do. And do not be like those who forgot Allah, so He made them forget themselves. It is they who are truly rebellious. The residents of the fire cannot be equal to the residents of the paradise. Only the residents of paradise will be successful. Had we sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would have certainly seen it humbled and torn apart in awe of Allah. We set forth such comparison for people, so perhaps they may reflect. He is Allah, there is no God worthy of worship except Him. Knower of the seen and unseen, He is the most compassionate, most merciful. He is Allah, there is no God except Him, the King, the Most Holy, the All-Perfect the source of serenity, the watcher of all, the almighty, the supreme in might, the majestic, glorified is Allah far above what they associate with him in worship. He is Allah, the creator, the inventor, the shaper. He alone has the most beautiful names. Whatever is in the heavens and the earth constantly glorifies him and he is the almighty, all wise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A round of applause for our brother Samir. <laughs> Jazakallah khair, brother Samir, for that beautiful recitation. May Allah bless you even more. May Allah bless your family. And uh, may Allah grant you the very best in this world and in the hereafter. So inshallah, the topic for today's discussion is the impact of Islamic civilization on the West. Many young Muslims have somewhat of an inferiority complex when it comes to the place of their culture and traditions in their Western homes. Unfortunately, not many realize quite how much of an impact Islam has had on Western civilization. At the same time, many in the West are interested to learn about the interface between Islam and the Western world. Ideally, our discussion regarding this shouldn't end with today's talk. And instead, it should continue, and we should continue our conversations in our homes and communities to continue to benefit society as a whole. A deeper understanding of our past provides us with many valuable lessons to apply in future relationships with people who both are like us and who are different to us. So we hope that this talk and the following Q&A, which will come after it, will plant the seeds for further discussion, further conversation, and the opening up of people of different faiths, different ideologies, to come together and to have a discussion about the things that they might agree on and the things that they might disagree with regards to in a way that benefits themselves and society as a whole. And so just to remind everyone, and rather to mention to everyone, that this event is being recorded and it's going to be sent on the TCD MSA YouTube page that we recently uh, got set up. So inshallah you can catch this on our YouTube channel at the end. We'll, send, we'll share the information with that afterwards. So my dear brothers and sisters, with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm Irish welcome to our guest, Ustad Adnan Rashid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatim al-anbiya wa sayyid al-mursaleen amma ba'd. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم 
بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وما ارسلنا کا الا رحمت للعالمین لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹلمین بردرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ایم آنرڈ ٹو بی ہے ونس اگین ٹرینیٹی کالج ڈبلن آئی بین ہے فیو ٹائمس اینڈ آئی ڈونٹ ریمبر دا ڈیٹس مینی پیپل ہیو بین ٹاکنگ ٹو می اباؤٹ می وزٹنگ آئرلینڈ اینڈ ڈوئنگ ایونٹس ہے ایف یو آس می ویر آئی واز اے منتھ اگو آئی ووڈ نو and I'm not joking. So it's very difficult for me to remember the places I have visited in the last few years, but it's always an honor to come to prestigious institutions like the Trinity College, where we can talk about these important issues. The topic of the day is Islamic civilization in the West or the Western civilization. Islam's influence or the influence of the Islamic civilization on the Western civilization. This is a very big topic. Many books have been written on this particular topic. What you will see tonight on the screen and what you will hear from me is tip of the iceberg. Each and every single point I will address tonight or each and every single slide you will see on the screen is a chapter in itself, potentially a book in itself. So what you will see is a summary of what we're trying to achieve tonight, a good understanding of this topic. So Islamic civilization, what is it and why is it important? And how can it, how can it impact another civilization? The relationship of Islam with the West has been seen in different lights by different scholars, different researchers, different uh, intellectuals. Some see reconciliation, some, some see uh, very positive relationship, cross-pollination of ideas throughout centuries in the last, let's say, 1,300 years. Others see a clash of civilizations. And then they read that clash into recent events. And that particular idea, the clash of civilizations, perception of the relationship between the two civilizations, leads to many misunderstandings and misreadings of the past. So many a times people jump from the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the founder of what we know today as the religion of Islam, to recent events in the Middle East. So they make a connection. So they put Muhammad on the one hand and what is happening in the Middle East nowadays or lately what, what's been happening on the other hand. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, peace be upon him, equals ISIS, for example. Without giving much attention to what happened between the history of 1,300 years, this man called Muhammad came with an idea. He preached a religion and he claimed to have been a successor of previous prophets not breaking away from them in any major way and confirming their messages of monotheism, charity, prayers, spiritual dynamics of having a relationship with the Creator, God Almighty. He shed light upon all these ideas, all these things. And then a civilization was born. And this civilization was seen from Spain to China. Within a century of the Prophet's death, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in the year 632 CE. Exactly a century later, if we were to use the Gregorian calendar, the year 732 CE, his followers, people who professed belief in his faith, were seen 
in northern France on the one hand and on the borders of China on the other hand. This was the largest stretch of land ever conquered, ruled, dominated by one group of people to date. If you ask the Muslims how did this happen, this was a phenomenal expansion within that short span of time, especially when those Muslims didn't have any special means to do all of this. How did this happen? How does it happen that within a century of the founder of this faith who was persecuted himself, heavily persecuted, his followers were killed due to this faith, he himself was attacked multiple times, he was beaten, he was uh, stoned, he was attacked militarily, his community was threatened continuously to the extent that they had no idea if they are going to survive all of these attacks. And not only that they overcome all these challenges, local challenges within the Arabian Peninsula, they come out to confront the Romans and the Persians simultaneously, the greatest powers in the world at the time, the greatest military powers, if you like. And the closest parallel I can draw is a poor country today, a very poor country, a small principality somewhere in Asia or in Europe, let's say, comes out and challenges China and Russia at the same time and defeats them. It's another thing that <laughs> something similar to that happened recently, not long ago, but that's another topic. So, how did this happen? This was phenomenal. How did these people, without any special equipments, how were they able to take all this land? Were the people of these lands sleeping? Were there no kings there? No militaries? No one stopping them? What happened? Did people open the gates to them? Did they walk through these gates? And this was the largest stretch of land ruled by one group of people to date. This expansion beat the expansion of Alexander the Great and even the Roman Empire at its peak. How did this happen? If you ask the Muslims, if someone was to come to the Muslims and ask this question, how did this happen? Muslims would simply point to the Quran that this is, uh, you know, God's doing. God did it. Muslims give a very simplistic answer, not necessarily incorrect or wrong. If you have faith in Islam, you can rightly so give this answer, no problem. The Quran in chapter 24, verse 55, categorically prophesied this occurrence, this cataclysmic event, as some see it, others see it as a cosmic expansion of a group of people who defeat everyone who comes along and take all this land. The Quran foretold this particular expansion in a verse whereby it is stated that it is a promise of God, Allah, to those who believe among you and do righteous deeds that he will grant you succession in the land like he granted it to those who came before you. So it's a promise. A promise was made and that promise was fulfilled. Within the first three generations of Islam, the Prophet's companions and their students, Tabi'een or Tabi'oon, and their students, Taba Tabi'oon. These three generations of Islam, within the first hundred years of Islam, achieved all of this. And the Quran is calling them believers because of achieving this. And this is how the promise was fulfilled. So this is the simplistic answer the Muslims give. Historians, on the other hand, they have other interests. They want to know how did this happen? This is phenomenal. And many historians have written works on this. The phenomenon called the early Islamic conquests. 
or the great Arab conquest, as one of my supervisors titled his book, Professor Dr. Hugh Kennedy, who was one of my teachers at SOAS in London, he has actually authored a book on this very topic, The, the Great Arab Conquest. So many scholars have talked about it. That's not the talk, uh, topic of the, of the day. I'm not going to indulge in that. Let's start from the point that the Arabs have defeated all neighboring empires. Let's start from that point. How, the, how that happened, what caused it, there are many answers to that question. And yet, scholars have not come up with anything satisfactory. When I say scholars, I mean Western historians are still baffled as to how this happened. What caused this expansion? Moving forward, from that point, the land has been taken. Muslims come out, they fight the Persians, they defeat them in one of the major battles called the Battle of Qadisiyah in current day Iraq and they take the Persian capital called Stesiphon, Madain in the Arabic language. On the other hand, another great battle, a very big battle, an important battle takes place uh, called the Battle of Yarmouk in current day Jordan, which was uh, the Byzantine, the Roman territory. And this is after the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad had died. And the verse I read in the very beginning of my talk is from the Quran, where the Quran states, O oh Muhammad, we sent you not except as a mercy for the worlds. So as far, as far as these companions of the Prophet were concerned, they had one focus in mind. When they take territory, they have to do justice or they have to be seen as doing justice. They have to do justice because this is what the Quran told them. They are doing what they're doing because of the Quran. Quran changed the outlook on life. These camel herders, shepherds, farmers, a bunch of traders, let's say from Mecca, a bunch of farmers from Medina, why would they come out and start fighting the Persians and the Romans otherwise? What drove them? Money, wealth, of the Persians and the Romans, they had no chance against these people. They were outnumbered by far, outgunned by far, or outsword, if you want to use that term for that time, right? They had no chance. Why would they put their lives at risk to go out and fight these titans? And they could have been blown away completely. So there was something else going on in their minds. And that was, as I understand the picture, they wanted to come out to not only defend themselves against these hostile, uh, tyrannical powers, they wanted to help the people of these lands. Because many of them were calling upon them to come and rescue them. And we will see some of the evidence tonight. So the people of the land of Syria, when the Muslims arrived in Syria, they opened the gates for the Muslims. This is very much documented historically that when Muslims came to fight the Romans in greater Syria at the time, which was Byzantine Roman territory, the people of the land of Syria in different towns in different places opened the gates for the Muslims. Why they did that is a very interesting topic. Historians have documented theories on that. One of the reasons was that these people were Orthodox Christians. And the ruling elite, the Romans or the Byzantines, were Chalcedonian Christians. They followed a different denomination. So they were heavily persecuting the masses. And the masses, due to that persecution, opened the gates for the new invaders, the Arabs. Not knowing who they were, what they will do. They open the gates and then they live with them and they see that these people, after all, are not that bad. They look scruffy, they look rough, they come from the desert, they look like barbarians, but in reality they're very civilized. They are just. And they did justice. Likewise in Persia, same thing happened. The Muslims go into the Persian territory. Many people open the gates for them, actually welcome them. A Jewish scholar writing a history of the Jewish people 
His name is Zion Zohar. He's an American Jewish historian. He writes that when Muslims arrived in Spain, the Jewish people welcomed them as liberators. So this was happening across the board. Professor Thomas Walker Arnold, who wrote a book in 1896, he published it titled The Preaching of Islam. In this book, he argues that one of the reasons Muslims took all this land so rapidly was the people on the ground helping them against the already existing rulers of these lands. This was the reason or one of the biggest reasons why they were able to take so much land so fast. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So they had the support of the people of Syria. When Muslims went into Egypt, the Coptic Orthodox Christians, they sided with the Arabs against the Byzantines, the Romans, because they found them to be very oppressive. Same happened in Spain. Similar things happened in Persia. And when Muslims came to rule, they applied justice. Absolute tolerance was promised. Treaties were made. People were told, you may keep your faiths, your churches, your places of worship, so long as you pay a tax so that we can protect you and your belongings, you may live in peace. All those Christian denominations fighting each other in Syria became peaceful after the Muslims took this land because they didn't have the freedom to fight each other anymore. The Muslims forbade them to fight each other because Muslims wanted peace. They wanted justice. So, what you are about to see tonight may surprise some of you. You may not have seen this evidence before. Uh, it is a product of hard work of many years. And uh, this is a very uh, summarized version of a very long course which I deliver in uh, an entire day. It has been summarized for you. You better thank me afterwards, inshallah. So, I talked about the expansion, the conquest, and uh, the point is now, what happened after this conquest? How did the, 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 these people feel? What were their feelings when the, the Arabs or the Muslims took all these territory in Persia and Byzantine? So, I have some testimonies. Michael the Elder in the 12th century, uh, copying earlier sources, he writes, when the cities submitted to the Arabs, they assigned to each denomination the churches which they found it to be in possession of. And at that time, the great churches of Amissa and that of Haran had been taken away from us by the Byzantines, i.e. the Romans. Nevertheless, it was no slight advantage for us to be delivered from the cruelty of the Romans. The Byzantines, their wickedness, their wrath and cruel zeal against us and to find ourselves at peace. So keep that verse of the Quran in mind as I go along. Chapter 21 of the Quran, verse 107. O oh Muhammad, we sent you not except as a mercy for the worlds. This was a promise made in the Quran and this was, this was the promise these early Muslims were carrying with them. They were reading it every single day. This is the text they're reading in the prayers. Quran is a public text read every single day in prayer. And they're hearing these words from God. As far as they're concerned, the Arabs, they, these are the words of God, right? And they're hearing these words and they want to deliver the promise. Or they want to be seen at least to have delivered the promise. So peace was their agenda. They want to bring peace to these people. Despite all the differences, despite all uh, the, the different denominations and all the, all the differences they had, religiously speaking. So this is an Orthodox Syrian monk writing in Syria. He's writing about the Arab conquest of these lands. Then a contemporary of these conquests was the III in Persia. He writes, 
And the Arabs to whom God at this time has given the empire of the world, behold, they are among you as you know well, and yet they attack not the Christian faith, but on the contrary, they favor our religion, do honor to our priests and the saints of the Lord, and confer benefits on churches and monasteries. Now, you may be thinking the topic is Islam's influence on the West. Why am I mentioning this? The reason why I'm mentioning this is that in order to influence someone, you have to have something to offer. If you don't have anything to offer, if you haven't, if you haven't achieved anything, then there's nothing to offer. How did the Islamic civilization come about in the first place is the question. What, what were the driving forces? What were the reasons behind what we call the Islamic civilization? What made the Islamic civilization is a very important question. And what gave rise to the Islamic civilization? And once it came about, how did this civilization impact other neighboring civilizations? This is the topic. So we're going to make a very smooth transition from the making of the Islamic civilization to the influence of the Islamic civiliza civilization on other civilizations, in particular the Western civilization. That's why we are dealing with this evidence. This is what made the Islamic civilization. So Ishijab writes that the Christian faith was not attacked by the Muslims. On the contrary, they favor our religion, do honor to our priests and the saints of the Lord and confer benefits on churches and monasteries. This is a Christian bishop, if you like, who was in Persia in the 7th century when the conquests had taken place. This is what he's talking about moving forward. Then in Syria in the 690s, we have a man called John Bar Penkaye. He writes, and he's a Christian writing in the Greek language. He writes, when Muawiyah, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad is ruling this territory, he writes, the peace throughout the world was such that we have never heard either from our fathers or from our grand grandparents or seen that there had ever been any like it. 690 CE. Now, what you saw there, those three quotes, these three quotes represent some of the realities of these people at that time when they were conquered by the Muslims, let's say. But after Muslims took these lands, what did they offer? What treaties, what terms were offered to the Christians and the Jews and the Zoroastrians in Persia, let's say, and uh, beyond? What terms were offered? Some of those terms are there on the screen. You can see there is a classical work of history authored in the second century of Islam by a man called Imam al-Baladuri. The book is titled Futuhul Buldan. In that book, we have been given the terms of the treaty the Prophet of Islam agreed with the Christians of Najran. Najran was a city in southern Saudi Arabia, which is still very much there. And this city was inhabited by Christians. These Christians came to see the Prophet of Islam in the final year of his life or the, or the year before he passed away. And they asked for terms. The Prophet presented Islam to them, accept Islam. They refused. They said, we will not accept Islam. We're not convinced. Now what? Now what? Detention? Disappearance? Torture? Getting killed? No. The Prophet offers these terms to them. Go back to your city, the city of Najran. Live in peace. Pay the tax and your churches will remain in security. Your bishops will not be removed. The, the evidence is, is on the screen. You can see it. Similarly, Imam Ibn Jarid al-Tabari, again another early Muslim historian from the 3rd century, he presents the treaty between the Muslims and the Christians of Palestine. The Muslims took the city in 637 CE, almost four to five years after the death of the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad. The Caliph at the time was Umar bin Khattab, the second Caliph of Islam. 
or the second successor of the Prophet of Islam. And these are the terms offered to the Christians. The patriarch of the city called Sophronius, he came to see the leader of the believers, the ruler, the caliph, dressed in very humble uh, clothing. And he asks him, what is going to happen to us? Omar tells him, we will offer you terms of peace and tolerance. And these were the terms that were offered to the Christians of Palestine. This is the protection which the servant of Allah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, grants to the people of Palestine. Thus, protection is for their lives, property, church, cross, for the healthy and sick, and for all their co-religionists. In this way that their churches shall not be turned into dwelling houses, nor will they be pulled down, nor any injury will be done to them or to their enclosures, nor to their cross, and nor will anything be deducted from their wealth. No restrictions shall be made regarding their religious ceremonies. Tolerance. Live in peace. Then when Muslims took Spain in the early 8th century, 711 CE is when the first Muslim armies landed at Gibraltar, also known as Jabal al Tariq. Right? Within four years, the Muslims took much of the Iberian Peninsula, currently known as Spain and Portugal collectively. And what treaties were offered? We have one of the treaties extent to this day. And this is, again, very consistent behavior. You saw the Treaty of Najran from the Prophet offered to the Christians of Najran. You saw the Treaty of Palestine agreed to with the Christians of Palestine by the second second successor of the Prophet of Islam. Now you see the Treaty of Spain, Al-Andalus, signed in the year 713 CE. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. This is a document granted by Abdulaziz bin Musa bin Nusayr to Theodomir, son of Gabdush, establishing a treaty of peace and promise, uh, a promise and protection of God and his Prophet. We Muslims will not set special conditions for him or for any among his men, nor harass him, nor remove him from power. His followers will not be killed or taken prisoner, prisoner nor will they be separated from their women and children. They will not be coerced in matters of religion. This is a very important clause, which is consistent throughout. All the Muslim promises of protection and tolerance, this is a clause that's consistently there. You will not be forced to leave your religion. You will not be coerced in matters of religion. Because this was very important. Taken directly from the Quran, chapter 2, verse 256. The Quran commanded the believers, do not coerce people to accept your faith. Truth stands clear from falsehood. Don't force people to accept your faith. La ikraha fid deen. Qad tabayyanu rushdu min al ghay. There is no compulsion in religion as truth stands clear from falsehood. So this was a very important clause for these vulnerable people. Who had, who had been conquered by an alien civilization because to date these people are not yet known. Who are these desert dwellers, rough looking people with a new idea who have come out to take all this territory? We have no idea what they're going to do. But these are the promises that were made. Then what was the outcome of these treaties? One can easily come back and say, you know what, these treaties are amazing. Uh, at least looking at our mo modern situation in the world, this day and age, having bill, bill of Rights, we have Geneva Convention and things like that, protecting human rights of people who are conquered by other powerful civilizations. These treaties are amazing. What they offer is amazing. But were they actually applied? Did they actually work? Were Muslims successful in delivering the promise? So before I answer that question, because if I went to the Muslim historians, you'll say, oh, they were biased. Who is going to say we were bad? A Muslim historian is never going to say we, we were bad. We, we tortured people. So Bernard the Wise, 
was a Christian pilgrim to Jerusalem in the 9th century. So we go to the Christians and the Jews and let them speak about how they felt under the rule of Islam and Muslims. After these treaties were offered to them centuries ago. And now we're in the 9th century. 200 years later, what happens? Bernard the Wise, a French pilgrim to Jerusalem in the 9th century, writes, the Christians and the pagans, the Muslims are called pagans by the Europeans at the time, have this kind of peace between them, there that if I was going on a journey and on the way the camel or donkey which bore my poor luggage were to die, and I was to abandon all my goods without any guardian and go to the city for another pack animal, when I came back, I would find all my property uninjured. Such is the peace there. Now imagine that for New York, London, Paris. <laughs> Brother Hassan is smiling. I wonder why. And many of you are smiling. You know why? Because now, not only that your luggage goes missing, people go missing with the luggage. Right? And that's the situation. And I'm not being biased. We have to do justice. And that's how the Muslim world is, unfortunately. Same thing would happen in Cairo, in Karachi, or let's say one, one of the major Muslim capitals. Things are bad in the world. Throughout the planet, there is chaos. Even Muslims are not taking Islam seriously. The rule of Islam is not applied. So, here is a Christian from the 9th century saying, if I was to leave my luggage in a place, and if I was to go away and come back, my luggage would be found untouched. Such is the peace in these people's lands. Same time, the same year, amazingly, the patriarch of the city of Jerusalem, the Christian leader, let's say, was writing a letter to his counterpart in Constantinople. He writes, the Saracens, i.e. the Muslims, show us great goodwill. They allow us to build our churches and to observe our own customs without hindrance. These are Christian testimonies. A 9th century Jewish source, again a contemporary source to Bernard the Wise and Patriarch Theodosius, this is, an, uh, this is an anonymous Jewish commentary on the Torah. This author writes, the people in, his who, whose, people in whose hands the temple is today, i.e. the Muslims, the Abbasids at the time, have made it into a choice, excellent and honorable place of worship. In other words, they allow us to worship in this place. The Jewish people in the 9th century, during the Abbasid period, are worshipping at the temple freely. So are the Christians. And keep those treaties in mind, those promises made by the Muslims in the 7th century. And this is what's happening in the 9th century, 200 years later, where Christians and Jews are testifying. This is the making of the Muslim civilization. Fast forward the 11th century. In Spain, 1080, a Jewish rabbi writing in Cordoba, the city of Cordoba. He writes that... As far as living and subsistence are concerned, our situation is the same as theirs or even better. So he's writing, he's paying a tribute to the Muslims. He's saying, you know what? We the Jews living in Cordoba under the rule of Islam and Muslims, we are not only as good as them, in some cases our conditions are better than theirs. In fact, in the 10th century, there was a Jewish prime minister to the most powerful Muslim monarch who ever ruled the territory of Spain, Abdurrahman III. He had a Jewish prime minister called Hazda ibn Shaprut. So, the outcome of this promise made to the Jews and the Christians of the lands Muslims took was what the, the Jews and the Christians testified to themselves, peace, justice relative justice given to most people, if not all. And what happens as a result? The Jews and the Christians, the youngsters become very inspired. I'm, 
Summarizing a very long story, by the way, yes. You, I may seem crude, jumping from century to century, jumping from uh, phenomenon to phenomenon, jumping from topic to topic, because time is very short, and I have a lot of evidence to share with you. So I can only give you ideas to explore. You can look into details by reading books, and you can ask me about books during the Q&A, and I can share some sources on this. So the outcome of the rise of the Muslim civilization was, I describe it as follows. The making of the Muslim civilization can be summarized through a formula. You know, sometimes to remember things, the easiest way is to summarize a very big topic into a small formula and you remember events, right? So you can have ideas in your mind, to remind you of great things. So I have a formula. I call it the golden chain of events in the history of Islam. The golden chain of events. It goes as follows. There are four locks in the chain. Number one is the revelation of the Quran. The Quran comes to the Prophet of Islam. The Quran is revealed to him in Arabia. From the Quran comes a sense of justice which was conveyed to the companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They take this concept of justice and they deliver it and bring peace to the world. As you have seen in those treaties and how the Christians and the Jews testified to it. From that peace came progress, which is what we are going to discuss. So going backwards, progress came from peace. Peace came from justice. Justice in the case of the Muslim civilization or the Islamic civilization came from the Quran. So, there is no progress without peace. No peace without, no justice without the Quran. As far as the Muslims are concerned, their justice or their understanding of justice, their concept of justice, their morality, their ethics are coming from the Quran. So this formula, remember it, the golden chain of events, Quran, justice, peace, progress. And people focus on the progress. Many a times when people talk about the Islamic civilization, they start talking about all the works Muslims pioneered in Al-Andalus, let's say the golden age, where Muslims became the best scientists, the best poets, the best intellectuals, the largest libraries in the world, street, streets paved, Street lights in Cordoba in the 10th century, the most civilized city, the largest city in the world. The best scholars are found in places like Baghdad, Damascus, Cordoba, Samarkand, Bukhara, you name it, throughout the Muslim civilization. These are the best centers of learning and education. You find observatories, you find libraries, you find scholars, you find book markets. If you go to Cordoba today, the city of Cordoba, you see the mosque of Cordoba in Spain. And around the mosque you see very congested uh, streets, very tight streets. And someone, you know, one may ask the question, why, why couldn't they expand these streets and make bigger pathways? The reason why they kept the streets that way is because this is how they were. And this was the biggest book market in the world at the time. Right? So this is what people talk about. When they talk about progress, the Islamic civilization, this is what they focus on. They don't see the causes that gave rise to the Muslim civilization. To the extent that the Muslim civilization was able to now influence other civilizations. My time is coming to an end, so I have to move very fast, inshallah, so that we have time to address your questions as well. So... The Muslims had dominated these lands and they brought peace and from peace came progress. Libraries were produced of huge magnitude. And the outcome was many Christians and Jews, they started to read Muslim works naturally. They became inspired by the Muslim civilization and many started to convert to Islam. And you can see on the screen there, in the 9th century, a Christian monk writing in secret. He is lamenting that these Christian youngsters of ours are reading Muslim philosophies. They know better Arabic than the Arabs. They are now performing poetry 
better than the Arabs. And the reason why he's lamenting is because this is the time when people were converting to Islam in massive numbers, Christians. People who were driven out of Spain later on in the 17th century in 1609 by Philip III were not Moors or Berbers or the Arabs. They were actually Hispanic who had converted to Islam in large numbers. Moving on. So what did this Islamic civilization do and how did this civilization influence the West? First, what do some of the intellectuals from the Enlightenment period think? Adam Smith was the founder of modern economic principles, the author of The Wealth of Nations, a very big, a very important book, The Wealth of Nations. In his works, he pays a lavish tribute to the Muslim civilization, as you can see on the screen. He writes... In one of his essays on astronomy, Adam Smith, writing in the 18th century, he was born in 1723 and he died in 1790, the founding father of capitalism. I don't know, do, do you know Adam Smith? Put your hands up. Adam Smith, okay, good, right. He was on the back of the 20 pound note uh, in Britain. He writes, the ruin of the empire of the Romans and along with it, the subversion of all law and order, which happened a few centuries afterwards, produced an entire neglect of that study of connecting principles of nature. He's talking about astronomy, the science of astronomy in particular. To which leisure and security can alone give occasion. If there is no security, one cannot study the connecting principles of nature. After the fall of those great conquerors, the Romans, and the civilizers of mankind, the empire of the caliphs, seems to have been the first state under which the world enjoyed that degree of tranquility which the cultivation of the sciences requires. It was under the protection of those generous and magnificent princes that the ancient philosophy and astronomy of the Greeks were restored and established in the East, that that tranquility which their mild, just and religious government diffused over their vast empire revived the curiosity of mankind to inquire into the connecting principles of nature. So Adam Smith is saying that their mild, just and religious government, in other words, Sharia system, the Sharia law, very much maligned lately in Western media outlets, was responsible for creating the golden age of Islam, their mild, just, and religious government. And he, this, this was a very learned man, by the way. He, he read a lot of books. He was one of the most learned philosophers of the 18th century Britain. Moving fast forward, Alfred Gillom, he wrote a book, The Legacy of Islam, published in 1931. In that book, he acknowledges the fact that it was Islam the religion, the faith, and the system that gave rise to what this book discusses. And the book discusses the progress I have highlighted already. But Islam is the fundamental fact which made the legacy possible. It was under the protection and patronage of Islamic empire that the arts and sciences which this book describes flourished. Then T.W. Arnold, Preaching of Islam, in his book, he states, Muslim Spain had written one of the brightest pages in history of medieval Europe. Her influence had passed through Provence into other countries of Europe, beginning or bringing into birth a new poetry and a new culture. And it was from her that Christian scholars received what of Greek philosophy and science they had to stimulate their mental activity up to the time of Renaissance. So what are these people talking about? Where did all this come from? How did the Muslims suddenly start to influence Western Europe with all this knowledge. What was happening in Western Europe? Western Europe was in darkness. In, in fact, some scholars called it the Dark Age. Others are challenging the notion, no doubt. Uh, but pretty much Western Europe was in darkness. Okay, no monuments, no major cities, right? If you go through Western Europe, Germany, France, Britain, uh, even Spain, if you minus the Muslim period, you don't see any monuments. You don't see any great universities or any remains of any great institutions. There's nothing there. Yeah, you see the, 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 the Roman wall, Hadrian's wall, uh, going across Britain in the north because he wanted to keep the Picts, the Scots, out. Right? So he put a wall there. 
starting from one uh, part of Britain going all the way to the other side of the coast or the other coast from uh, um, basically um, it's, a, it's a wall that stretches about 170 miles in northern Britain. Apart from that, there's nothing. So Europeans were hungry for knowledge. And where did they find it? Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain. How Islamic Spain came up, what happened there, again, there are books written on these topics. Books, immense books with a lot of detail. All the universities, all the libraries, and what occurred in Islamic Spain once Muslims took Spain in 711, and thenceforth, what happened? What happened to the cities? What happened to the Christians? What happened to the Jews? So, in his history of medicine, Victor Robinson, he draws a very eloquent parallel between <clears throat> medieval Europe and the city of Cordoba, ruled by Islam and Muslims. Europe was darkened at sunset, Cordoba shone with public lamps. Europe was dirty, Cordoba built a thousand baths. Europe was covered with vermin, Cordoba changed its undergarments daily. Europe lay in mud, Cordoba's streets were paved. Europe's palaces had smoke holes in the ceiling. Cordoba's arabesques were exquisite. Europe's nobility could not sign its name, Cordoba's children went to school. Europe's monks could not read the baptismal service. Cordoba's teachers created a library of Alexandrian dimensions. And this was, again, the progress I talked about. This progress cannot be divorced from peace that the Muslims brought with them for them to achieve this in the first place. And that peace came from the justice they offered to everyone in those societies. And that justice originated from the Quran. Otherwise, how did they suddenly wake up? And same model was replicated from Spain to China. It could be an accident in Spain. Maybe the climate was very nice. The fruits were very beautiful. They were tasty, right? Or maybe the women of Spain were very nice looking and the Arabs fell in love with them and suddenly became happy and they created a civilization. You know, people can talk about all sorts of stupid things, right? And come up with reasons. But this was not an accident because this was replicated throughout the Muslim civilization. You see the calligraphy and artwork in Cordoba or let's say in the city of Granada or Seville. When you look at those monuments, who has been to Seville and Granada? Anyone? Have you seen Alcazar and Alhambra Palace? When you look at the artwork, you have to acknowledge that this is the peak of human excellence. It's the peak of human excellence. They could not do better than that. How did that happen? Was that an accident? Absolutely not. Mermaduke Pictor, who was uh, an Englishman who had uh, accepted Islam, in the early 20th century, he wrote in his book, The Cultural Side of Islam. In Spain, under the Umayyad and in Baghdad, under the Abbasid Caliphs, Christians and Jews, equally with Muslims, were admitted to the schools and universities. Not only that, but were boarded and lodged in hostels at the cost of states. Then in Baghdad, in the 9th century, an institution was made to translate Greek works into the Arabic language. Now, after the Muslims have taken this land, they have consolidated their power, they have offered terms to the native people of these lands, they have established a peaceful relationship, there is tolerance. And after this consolidation, now is the time to rise, to make progress, to create a civilization. And in the 9th century in Baghdad, in the city of Baghdad, medieval Baghdad, this is what's happening. Greek works, Greek knowledge, Greek wisdom is being translated into the Arabic language. And suddenly, a lot of these Muslims woke up to that phenomenon. They took a lot from the Greeks and they left a lot. So these works ended up in libraries throughout the Muslim world, in particular Spain. So there were many libraries of repute throughout the Muslim world with hundreds of thousands of volumes. 
The first library of importance and value in Europe was the Royal Library of the Umayyads in Cordoba. Abdurrahman I was himself a scholar and a poet. His son Hisham followed his footsteps by becoming a poet and an, an admirer of Arabic literature. And then Hakam I also loved poetry and liked to be surrounded by scholars. The later caliphs, especially Abdurrahman III and Hakam II, were devoted to the hobby of collecting rare books, a disease that I myself have caught. Abbas bin Naseh, the agent of Abdurrahman III, traveled as far as Mesopotamia in search of Arabic translations of Persian and Greek works on science. Rare and valuable books, old and new, were bought and copied for Hakam II in Alexandria, Cairo, Baghdad, and Damascus. The chief librarian of Hakam II, the caliph in Cordoba in Western Europe at the time, was a high-ranking eunuch. Talid, according to whom there were 400,000 volumes of books in the royal library, the list of the books recording the names of the authors and the titles alone consisted of 44 volumes of 50 folios each. The largest library in human history to date. The 10th century Cordoba. The largest library ever assembled in human history to date. Larger than Alexandria, what happened in Alexandria in the ancient period. This is the Renaissance that was taking place. And there were 70 public libraries in the city of, um, in the city of Cordoba. The result was Muslim men of science. Moving on very fast. Okay. I do apologize for going over time. The result was Muslim men of science. Again, I, I want to remind every one of you that I am uh, brutalizing these facts by being very succinct and brief about these facts. What I am sharing with you is not even tip of the iceberg. There is a lot of information out there in books on these very topics. Okay, so I have summarized. It's like, you know, as they say, it's like to confine a river into a cup. It's not possible, right? But I'm trying my best to put these things in front of you so that you can actually get these glimpses and go out and start studying these topics. You can take any of them uh, for your personal study. Muslim men of science, the list goes on and on and on. People who wrote in geography, people who wrote in astronomy, medical encyclopedias, physiology, materia medica, diagnosis, therapeutics, hygiene, okay, uh, uh, commentaries on Aristotle and Galen, for example, travel writing, laxatives, poisons, geography, algebra, tri tri trigonometry, uh, and zoology, and you name it, Muslims had created something absolutely shocking in these centers of learning, like Cordoba, Baghdad, Damascus, Samarkand, Bukhara, these cities, right? So what happened with this knowledge? Now the Europeans woke up, okay? And Muslims produced some original works. Some people claimed due to their religious and cultural bias, in particular in the West, during the 19th century, many people, many Western historians, they woke up to this plethora of literature and they, they realized, hold on a second, you know, we've been trying to paint Islam and Muslims as barbaric and as, 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 as a primitive, mysterious, um, you know, some strange civilization, but these people gave rise to our own civilization. So this was very difficult to swallow for many, uh, let's say, European thinkers at the time because they were dominant. They had colonized many Muslim territories. For them to acknowledge that this inferior civilization that we have dominated once upon a time inspired our rise, right? So they started to play down the role of Islam and Muslims or the Muslim civilization. John William Draper, who wrote a work titled The History of the Intellectual Development of Europe. In that book, he acknowledges that the European scholarship systematically suppressed facts about the Islamic civilization, that it was directly behind the intellectual development of European scholarship. Same has been acknowledged by a recent scholar in her works. Her name is Maria Rosa Menacol. She has authored a book on Spain, Ornament of the World, titled Ornament of the World. She writes in her works that 
Western scholars to this day in the 21st century find it very difficult to acknowledge that they are in some way in debt to the Islamic civilization. It's very unfortunate. You see the bias on media. You see it. You see it glaring in your face. So Muslims produced original works. One of the propagandas was that Muslims is copied from the Greeks. They found Greek works, they translated them, and they copied and pasted, they plagiarized, and they forwarded all these works to the Europeans. But the reality is, the Muslims actually not only copied from the Greeks, they completely turned Greek sciences around. They produced independent researches. As you can see on the screen, there are some examples where Muslims actually wrote commentaries on Greek authors and correcting their, corrected their basic errors. So Muslims had advanced in science and... So how did the Muslims transfer this knowledge? I'm finishing right now, Brother Hassan. I know you're going to very soon physically remove me from the podium before that <laughs> comes, before it comes to that, where nearly there. How did this knowledge trans how was this knowledge transmitted to the Western world, coming to the point of discussion? How did Islam and the Muslim civilization influence the Western world? How did that happen? Firstly, many Western scholars or students of scholars, they had to learn the Arabic language. Englishmen, German students, French students had to learn the Arabic language in order to unlock this knowledge which was available in Spain at the time for almost 500 years from the 9th to the 14th century. So scholars were traveling from Europe to study with the Muslims or Jews and Christians who spoke Arabic well, who lived in that Arabic culture. The Arabic language was the lingua franca of the educated world, the status the English language enjoys in the world today was enjoyed by the Arabic language for 500 years throughout the Western world, by the way. I'm talking about not the Muslim lands, I'm talking about Britain, France and Germany. You may be thinking Arabic? 500 years in these lands? Yes, absolutely. Facts that are very little known to the world. You know who was the most learned man to walk in London in the 11th century or in the 12th century? The one who knew the Arabic language. Such a person would be a celebrity. Just like you go to Pakistan and you go to a government office and speak English, doors will open. You know what I'm talking about, yeah? You go to Egypt, don't speak Arabic, don't try. Speak English and watch wonders happening. Same, same was happening in Britain, France and Germany in the 10th, 11th and 12th century. The celebrities of those societies were those who spoke the Arabic language. People like Adelard of Bath, Daniel of Morley, Robert the Scot, Robert of Ketton, Michael the Scot, these people. There is a book authored by a Jewish historian. Her name is Dorothy Metzlitsky. She wrote a fascinating book on this very topic, specifically dealing with England, not all of Europe, England. And the book is titled, The Matter of Araby in Medieval England. The Matter of Araby in Medieval England. She talks about this phenomenon. Arabic sciences, Arabic knowledge in England in particular. She gives plenty of examples of this. Mind-blowing. How did this happen? After learning the Arabic language, these European scholars actually felt sorry for their countrymen and their people. So they started to translate these works from Arabic to Latin. So Gerard, Gerard of Cremona translated 80 works from Arabic to Latin on astronomy and mathematics, including Al Khawarizmi's Al Jabra, Thabit bin Qurra's work on Roman balance, Al Kindi's optical works, writing on chemistry by Al Razi, and Ibn Sina's medical encyclopedia. John of Seville translated astronomical, medical, and philosophical works by Al-Kindi, Al-Battani, Thabit bin Qurra, Al-Qabisi, Al-Farghani, and Al-Shifa of Ibn Sina, Makasid al-Falasifa, the ways of the philosophers, by Al-Ghazali. Plato of Tivoli 
made substantial amount of translations from Arabic to Latin and the complete list of translators and their translations far too much to cover here. Absolutely. This is not even tip of the iceberg. What happened in Spain in cities like Toledo after Christian kings took the city of Toledo in 1085 from the Muslims, when the king walked into the Muslim library, he was blown away. He had realized that he has discovered the true, the real reason of Muslim advancement at that time. Books. He got these scholars to translate all of this work, or much of it, in the Latin language. And then it was moved to the Europeans. And lo and behold, the European Renaissance. Muslim Spain had written one of the brightest pages in the history of medieval Europe. Her influence had passed through Provence into the other countries of Europe, bringing into birth a new poetry and a new culture. Okay, so Professor Thomas Arnold, in his book, Preaching of Islam, page 131, states, the Renaissance was directly inspired by Islamic Spain. George Saliba, in 2007, authored a book, Islamic Science and the Making of the European Renaissance. The making of the European Renaissance. What names come to mind when you think of European Renaissance? Anyone? Very quickly. Go ahead. Names. Medici's. Sorry? Medici's. Okay. Good. Alexander. Sorry? Alexander. Alexander. Oh, no, no. That's very old. The European Renaissance. I'm talking about the 15th and the 16th century. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci. Anyone else? Michelangelo. Who else? Anyone else? Raphael. Sorry? Raphael. Raphael. Absolutely. Many names. But if you look at their works and the origins, you will realize many of these scholars, Renaissance scholars, writing in Italy and France and other places, they were directly inspired by knowledge that came from Al-Andalus, from Muslim Spain. George Saliba writes on page one, there is hardly a book on Islamic civilization or on the general history of science that does not at least pretend to recognize the importance of the Islamic scientific tradition and the role this tradition played in the development of human civilization in general. Absolutely. E.J. Holmyard on chemistry, on the history of chemistry, writes on page 82, early European chemistry is almost wholly a legacy from Islam. It is impossible to understand medieval Latin alchemy without a clear idea of the work of the Arabs. So, even the University of Oxford, the first science taught at the University of Oxford was astronomy. And it came directly from the Arabs from Spain. R. T. Gunther, in his History of Science at Oxford, this is what he has to say, as you can see on the screen, that the first science taught at Oxford was astronomy and it came from the Arabs. So ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I'll stop. Again, do forgive me for being very brief and brutal with these facts. Brutal because I couldn't give you more I have a lot more to share as I explained earlier that this is a very long course summarized for you to fit into one hour, okay? And there is a lot more I can share and describe and explain which may blow your minds away, right? But believe you me, there is a lot that needs to be looked into and studied for you to better understand the influence of Islam and the Muslim civilization on the Western civilization. Okay, and if you have any questions, you may ask during the Q&A. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you so much for listening. Very good. <clears throat> what caused the Islamic civilization to decline, in other words? Okay, I don't believe in the decline theory. I believe the Islamic civilization is still very much uh, alive. It is a living civilization. Uh, it is uh, going through some tough period. Uh, for example, you see, if you study the history of the Islamic civilization, this civilization is like a flower 
that leaves its fragrance in the hand that comes to crush it. Okay, so even in Al-Andalus, the Islamic civilization is alive in monuments, in the achievements, in the libraries. When you go and see those manuscripts, is there. So the decline theory, I don't fully agree with it. Uh, we are going through a phase. We are going through a very tough time in our history. Uh, we have uh, gone through uh, similar situations in the past, like the Mongol invasions. Mongol invasions in the 13th century destroyed, devastated much of the Muslim civilization in the East. The Mongols started killing <clears throat> from Mongolia and they went all the way to Syria. They invaded India for 100 years. They tried to destroy the civilization of Islam in India, the Delhi Sultanate. They did that for 100 years. The Muslims stood in the way. I mean, in India, it's, it's very funny what's happening today, uh, that Muslims are blamed for a lot of the things. But if you look at uh, the history, if the Muslims did not stand in the way of the Mongols for 100 years, the sultans and the armies, the Mongols would have devastated India. They were, they were lusting after India because of its wealth, right? So uh, we had similar upheavals, if you like, in our history, and they passed. So will this one. What, what's happening today, Muslims just need to wake up and realize that we are in the situation we are in is because we have left behind uh, the reason we uh, once uh, were successful. So once Muslims wake up to the reasons, that's why I mentioned the reasons first. You see, this was the reason why I went through that long process of explaining why the Islamic civilization uh, rose in the first place, what gave birth to it, those principles, those ideas, that justice and peace that was delivered by the Muslims. So once we start to work on that again, bring justice to our own uh, countries, let's say, uh, and then start to build those institutions, we can inspire the world once again. What was done before can be done again, as long as it's the right thing to do. So I don't believe in that decline theory. I don't think we are in decline yet. Yes, you have questions? Yeah, a few questions are coming in on mm -hmm. the Slido. So one of the questions is, why did Bernard Lewis, uh, sorry, Bernard Lewis, why did Bernard the Wise call Muslims pagans? I don't mind talking about Bernard Lewis if you want me to. <laughs> uh, why did Bernard the Wise? Call Muslims pagans. Because uh, during the Middle Ages, the Muslims were generally referred to by the Christian clergy as pagans. Because there were many misconceptions. Even during the Crusades, when you look at the writings of some of the monks writing the history of the Crusades, they were outrightly lying about Muslims. The Muslims have an idol of Muhammad and they worship that idol in the temple. Okay? Uh, for example, Falk of Charts, who was a crusading chronicler, who was a historian of the Crusades, he wrote, the Muslims worship an idol of Muhammad, which, was, which is a lie. That never happened in our history. So, a lot of lies were fed to European masses at the time. The clergy who were teaching the masses, the Catholic Church, I'm sorry to say, uh, predominantly at the time, was very ignorant of Islam and Muslims, right? And when someone tried to correct the errors, they were excommunicated by the church. So the church wanted to keep the masses ignorant about Islam, to have hostility towards Muslims. And this is why the Muslims are referred to as uh, pagans and a lot of derogatory things and there were many lies made up about the Muslims and if you want to study that phenomenon there is a book on it a very power actually a few books on it few books one of them is Islam and the West making amazingly uh, the same topic I addressed today <laughs> Islam and the West making of an image Islam and the West making of an image. The author is Norman Daniel. Norman, an excellent work, a must read. Also, read the works of J.V. Tolland. J.V. Tolland, T-O-L-A-N-D. He has also written on this phenomenon, how uh, people in the West saw the Muslims. Okay? And many more books can be cited, but these two works or these two authors will do wonders for you, inshallah. Very good. Um, the next question I think we'll ask uh, has gotten a few likes and it's put quite succinctly, female scholars question mark. Oh yes, 
Absolutely. It's, it's amazing that you mentioned that. Uh, I would like to address, uh, I would like to uh, bring to your attention something uh, very interesting. There is a book on this very topic. Perhaps you can get hold of this book and read it. The author is Asma Saeed. She's a Cambridge University scholar. Okay. The author is Asma, A-S-M-A. -A. Okay. Saeed is spelt with S-A-Y-E-E-D. -E the title of the book is Women and the Transmission of Religious Knowledge in Islam. A very specific book written on women and their scholarship in Islam. And she addresses the history of few centuries. Okay? She starts from the second century of Islam. And I think she goes up to the Ottoman period. So this is a very important work for you to consult. Published by the Cambridge University. Women and the transmission of religious knowledge in Islam. In fact, not only that, uh, women were absolutely crucial, central to the production of libraries in Cordoba. I, I'm, I, I'm very thankful for raising uh, this point. Uh, I do apologize for not raising this earlier. I mean, being, uh, you know, again, <laughs> I don't want, yeah. being a man, men always f focus on, you know, achievements of men. So I should have mentioned this earlier, right? Women in Spain, in, in Al-Andalus, when the Muslims ruling Spain were instrumental in producing those libraries. Guess how? They were the best calligraphers. They were copying works for libraries. So if a manuscript came from Baghdad that was in fashion, that was in demand on, let's say, science, let's say, astronomy, let's say, alchemy or medicine, there would be uh, women working actively in libraries to copy those manuscripts in hand. So there were hundreds, hundreds of women scholars and calligraphers who were working day and night transcribing these works so that they can be libraries. So Hakam II, his 400,000 volumes didn't come from a vacuum because there were many ladies, many women, many scholars who were producing these works. Okay, and there's a lot more we can discuss, but again, it's a topic in itself. That sister had a question earlier. Yes, please. Here. Yes. But how does that relate, or how can we reconcile that with, for example, ethnic minorities now who have been oppressed for so long that they have forgotten their own language, or even if they do remember it, it has lost its um, prestige due to the imperialistic influence from outside. It's just a very personal thing because, you know, in different countries, um, even if they adopt a different language um, on their own will, it is because it has lost its you see, this phenomenon can be repeated. Uh, it has happened in India, for example, when Britain was ruling India for 200 years. The first century was consolidation of power. The second century was actually exerting civilizational influence on the masses, right? And this is why many Muslim leaders and intellectuals in India became worried because many Muslim youth were being lost to British influences, right? Because Britain was the power uh, uh, ruling India at the time. Uh, most major universities were uh, British. They were supported by the government. And uh, Victorian England was phenomenal in terms of producing literature and books and libraries. So many Muslims got mesmerized. That's why some of the scholars woke up. And they decided that we must educate our youngsters about our achievements for over a thousand years for them to realize that this is not new for us. It's just we just woke up to this reality that we are in this situation, in this state of affairs. But we have a huge civilization behind us, achievements of a thousand years. So remember that. That's why they established an institution called the Aligarh University. And same can happen uh, in other places like China, for example, what, what's happening in China due to persecution, the Uyghurs, 
are being forced to lose their culture and language. Similar things happened in Spain. When Muslims lost territory in Spain, the Catholics came in, okay, uh, the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, when they took the last stronghold from the Muslims in 1492, they forced the entire population, close to half a million people, native Hispanic Muslims, they were called Moriscos, okay, and I have a lecture tomorrow evening on this in London, okay. Moriscos were basically called Moriscos uh, basically as an insult, but they were not Moors. Moors basically came from North Africa, current day Morocco and the Sahara Desert, right? But these people in Spain who were Muslims were native Spaniards. They were Hispanic originally, right? But their culture and language was snatched away from them. And wallahi, if you were to read about Moriscos and their experience in Spain, you will shed tears. You will cry. You think, you think this is persecution? What we are seeing nowadays, let's say in China, I mean, it's bad, as bad as it is. But when, once you read about Moriscos, you will see how those people were put through immense difficulties and challenges to lose their faith. They were forced into baptism. They were forcefully converted. And still they resisted. They were practicing uh, Islam in secret. They were called crypto-Muslims. They were practicing Islam in secret and the Inquisition was breathing down their necks. They had to hang pigs at their doorsteps to convince the Inquisitors that they are Christian. But they were not Christian. They had to hide their books in walls. They could not be seen to be excessively clean. That was a sign of Islam. In Spain, if you had a bath every week, you were a Muslim. And this is not, I'm not making this up. If you were clean, if you were walking around clean, clean clothes, clean body, good hygiene, Inquisition. Straight to Inquisition. This guy is a Muslim. He can't be a Christian. Because that wasn't the culture of the Christians at the time. Muslims, as part of their religion, you have to wash every day, five times a day. You wash for prayer. And you at least bathe once a week uh, if you are from civilized Muslim territories. Okay. So um, these things can happen. They have happened in the past and they're being repeated today. May Allah protect us. But again, I believe Islam to this day, this is why I don't believe in the decline theory. I don't believe we are on the decline. Islamic civilization is still very much powerful, very standing, very influential in the world and still can contribute a lot of positivity in the future to come, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Um, another interesting question we have. Um, so someone mentioned that they're planning to visit Andalusia next month to mm. learn and witness Islamic history there. Mm. What are your recommendations on reading our lectures? So I find it quite interesting that um, uh, people might not realize the, the significance and the place of Islam in what is currently uh, known as the West. So uh, I think that's quite a pertinent kind of question. There are many books you can read. Uh, one of them is by Richard Fletcher, Moorish Spain. You can read that book. You can read A Political History of Islamic Spain written by, again, one of my teachers, Hugh Kennedy, uh, Islamic Spain and Portugal. He has written a book. Then uh, there is an author called Anwar Shahna. His book is very difficult to find, Muslim Spain. There are two volumes published by Routledge or Routledge Press uh, titled The Legacy of Muslim Spain. If you want to go academic, if you really want, uh, you know, complicated details on the achievements of, the Mus of Muslims in Spain, then uh, there, these are these two volumes, uh, The Legacy of Muslim Spain, uh, edited by Salma Khadra Jayusi. Uh, it's an academic work, very, uh, you know, very powerful work. And there are many other books you can read. But Get uh, Ornament of the World is a good start by Maria Rosa Menocal. It's a very simple, very plain, very easy to read book, Ornament of the World. Maria Rosa Menocal. Okay. And then there are many histo histories written by Muslim historians as well. If you want to read them, there are many available, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Another interesting question we have. Um, how come Islam isn't, uh, how come Spain isn't a Muslim country? Because Islam was completely systematically wiped out from Spain. The Pope from Rome specifically commanded 
Spanish kings and queens to wipe out Islam. Wipe, completely wipe out any traces of Islam. And that means books, monuments, people, or everything. Can you imagine a people lived in a land for 800 years? Listen carefully. A people lived in a land for 800 years and at one point in the 11th century, the population of Muslims in Spain was 5.5 million people. There are no graves. No graves. In Spain today, there are no graves of Muslims. None. 5.5 million Muslims lived there once upon a time. What happened to the graves? Completely wiped out, systematically broken, desecrated, even tombstones were completely destroyed. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that Alhambra Palace in Granada and the Masjid of Kartaba is still standing to this day. The Catholic Church wanted to destroy the Mosque of Cordoba many times. The people of Cordoba, even though they were Christians, they stood in the way. They said, we will not allow you to destroy this. This masterpiece, we will not allow you to destroy it. So, uh, that's the answer. Extermination. Ethnic cleansing. Literally. Moriscos, after Granada fell, there was an ethnic cleansing, a cleansing that took place in the 16th century. Complete wipeout. Okay, and still Muslims survived in the mountains of Al Pujaras, Al Pujaras mountains near Granada. Some Muslims survived and they tried to keep up some Islamic traditions that survive to this day in Spanish culture. Some words, some traditions, some uh, food items, they're still there. Jazakallah mm. Khair, I'm getting the call to wrap up. Um, I wanted to ask another one last question, but if I do ask that, we'll probably, we're probably going to be kicked out of this <laughs> lecture theatre. Um, so I'd like to say Jazakallah Khair to our brother Adnan for uh, giving us the opportunity to host you. Uh, and we will be delighted for you to come back um, in the future, inshallah. inshallah. So, Jazakallah Khair. Thank uh, you very much, everyone. Uh, do look, look into the books I have recommended and uh, definitely look into this topic, Islam's influence on Western Europe. Just Google. Just Google the title, Islam's influence on Western Europe. You will see a number of books okay, on this to topic. Many scholars have addressed this. And start reading a basic book and you will get amazing facts okay thank you so much for listening alhamdulillah rabbil alamin assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh